This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So, welcome everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you and a great pleasure to welcome our speaker for this year's uh, joint BSR-ICS lecture, Vincent Jolide from the Economie Supérieure in Paris. We have a lecture every year jointly with the British School. Um, please see Jill Knight here representing the school. Uh, sorry, at the back. Oh, hi. Hi, Jill. <laughs> um, the, Brit the British schools abroad, there's uh, the basis institutes, um, of which the six abroad, the Society of Libyan Studies, which as you know um, have been funded for many years by the British government um, and continue, we hope, to be funded in the future, but there'll be much debate about this. But there are only one of the set of public uh, foreign schools in um, the Mediterranean and uh, our sisters, if you like, the Ecole Normale, uh, sorry, the Ecole Française and the German Archaeological Institute and so on. And for those who don't know it, within the Roman context, schools work together very commonly. And so it's very nice that the director of the British School of Rome has uh, nominated uh, one of our French colleagues um, to come and speak to us today in this lecture. Vincent Jolivet is a director de recherche in the CNRS, based at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in the Rue d'Un in Paris, uh, but very fortunately uh, is able to spend quite a lot of his time a long way south of there. <laughs> um, those who uh, know his work will know that he's worked, um, he's worked in Greece as well, but also uh, on the topography of Rome, uh, on Renaissance cartography of the city, uh, but most of all famous for Etruscan studies um, and excavations, the studies of material in the States and in Italy uh, and in Paris. But what he's going to speak to us about today is um, the rock cut tombs of Grotte Scalina near Viterbo, just to the north of Rome. So, Vincent, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very, very much for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you also to all those who participated to this uh, invitation. So as it's a rather long uh, talk, uh, I will begin immediately. Uh, so, uh, for uh, introduce uh, Grotte Scalina, we have first to uh, <coughs> to introduce a general geographic uh, frame. Uh, so we are in the very uh, it's near the city, the Etruscan city of Musana. Uh, we've been digging for 20 years at the French School at Rome. Uh, in the very center of the territory of the mighty city of uh, Tapuinia, which, is, which has been at the end of the 4th century uh, the big uh, how, let's say, rampart wall uh, against the uh, Roman uh, conquest of, uh, of Etruria. The Romans were in Sutrium and in uh, Nepi. Well, Nepi is not here. But, is it? Um, so, uh, two words about uh, Musarna. Uh, Musarna has this incredibly uh, regular plan. Uh, it's the only one known in uh, Etruria of a, a city, which is a small city, because it's only five hectares, but it's a true city, with a central plan, square and magistrates and everyone. So we think that it has been created at the end of the fourth century uh, to, uh, <clears throat> as a kind of colony, uh, with the people who were uh, working the, the earth during the peace period and uh, uh, warriors during the, uh, the war. Uh, what's interesting for us now, what, so we've been, we've been beginning to publish Musa, now we have three volumes and uh, I guess that five also are now in, <laughs> in preparation by different people. Uh, what's interesting uh, to understand better is the importance of the tomb of Grotte Scalina, which is only one kilometer and a half north of uh, Musarna, is the uh, Hellenistic necropolis of uh, Musarna, which has a very special type of tomb. Uh, you see them here. Uh, they are square, cubic, from, uh, carved in the, in the rock, in the two for bedrock and uh, normally made only for one, uh, one people. Uh, those, and you have other tools, uh, I'll speak about them later, but those are interesting because, uh, well, this kind, see. Uh, 
they can contain also bronzes and uh, various. Here is interesting because what left the tombarol is a plenderous. Uh, shows us that in a part the body was here, and here there were uh, vases for uh, the stockage of uh, of bread of uh, any kind, and here uh, vases uh, for banqueting. So oinoko uh, ekiatoi <clears throat> of this type and, and so on. But of course we have only a small part of. Uh, <laughs> of the objects because uh, this necropolis has everyone, uh, every necropolis in Etruria has been plundered so many times. But uh, at the beginning of the nine, of the um, uh, 20th century, uh, Rossi Danieli, a great uh, archaeologist in Viterbo, uh, dug uh, 20 of those tombs and in uh, every tomb he found this kind of ceramic which is typical of uh, the, uh, the last quarter of the 4th century before Christ. So those tombs are the tombs of the first inhabitants of Muzana, and it goes, goes well with, with what we think, we think about uh, the presence of columns, not big families, but columns with one person or two persons uh, coming to live in Muzana. After, but after only, we have those tombs like uh, the most beautiful ones, in the, one of the most beautiful, uh, interesting, let's say, in Etruria with uh, two family tombs of the Aletna family, uh, with a total of uh, 120 sarcophagi, uh, originally, of course, now with uh, plunderings and uh, war, and a uh, <laughs> uh, uh, few of them are preserved in various parts. Of, some in Viterbo, some in Copenhagen, some in uh, Berkeley and uh, Philadelphia. Uh, but in those tombs, uh, we never found, uh, and before they never found, this uh, red figure uh, pottery. It means that uh, those tombs are, uh, have been created after the Roman conquest around 280 before Christ. So now, uh, with this view of uh, the tombs in Muzana, we can go to Grotescalina. So Muzana is here, and Grotescalina uh, along the same uh, river, which is a very beautiful uh, Leia River. If you come, you have to make a walk around. It's very romantic. <laughs> uh, near another place, Cordigliano, which is an archaic and uh, Hellenistic uh, site, but, but smaller. <coughs> Uh, what we knew about uh, when we began uh, we began the excavation in Muzana in uh, 1983, uh, we knew this uh, picture and this uh, drawing. So uh, the picture of a very important tomb you see here, around uh, <coughs> 19,000, and uh, this drawing, always by Rossi Daniele, uh, which shows a strange facade, which is doesn't record anything uh, in the Etruscan uh, world. And uh, uh, here is a tomb, and you see that it's very, very small, uh, two, two meters square. Uh, we've been looking for uh, this tomb for uh, a long time, for different years. We've been uh, looking in the, uh, around uh, Cordigliano, which is a place, uh, and we never, um, never found it. At the end, we thought, also because no one since uh, 19,000 uh, had seen it. We thought that it had been destroyed and uh, existed no more. We have, uh, the owner of Muzana had the habit of uh, exploding uh, Etruscan tombs to make various uh, <laughs> uh, transformation in his uh, estate. Uh, but I would like to say uh, by a great uh, uh, reflection, but uh, it was a case. Uh, in uh, 1998, uh, we found it again, these, uh, these two, you see it, and uh, as it was at the beginning, much more romantic, because you know that archaeologists are really a, a shame, and uh, now <laughs> it's not uh, romantic as it used to be. Uh, this is after us. Uh, we begin the excavation. So uh, a long time uh, passed between the rediscovery and the beginning of the excavation in 2011, because 
at that time we were finishing Musa, now we were not specially interested in tombs. Uh, it seemed to be a, a small thing, so uh, we had more interesting things to do. And uh, the, the idea to, to dig it was only because a, a student of mine is doing a thesis about the Hellenistic uh, necropolis in Musana. So it was interesting to understand this strange uh, tomb. Uh, so, uh, so in 2011, we went to the owner of the uh, it's a farmer and his wife. Uh, to ask for the authorization uh, to dig, uh, showing the drawing with a small tomb and uh, saying, oh, it's not deep, uh, it's not big, so in a week we will finish. <laughs> and, uh, you wanna, and the lady told her, ah, yeah, you know, you said, ah, yeah, go, 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 go. And, uh, <laughs> and after a week we were at uh, three meters and a half uh, deep and there was still no tomb. So it was clear that, uh, and at that time she said, ah, yeah, I know it's a, a very deep tomb and a big one, and my, uh, my uncle plundered it in the 70s. And so so uh, the drawing of Forsythenini was completely false. Probably uh, someone told uh, him that it was not interesting to keep it to dig. <coughs> From uh, for the occupation of this area, uh, 2013, we were uh, trying to see how uh, was the access to the tomb because we have the tomb and uh, a road uh, eight meters uh, deeper. So uh, so probably there was an access with a stair, but difficult to say because the tufo is uh, of very bad quality. So probably it has been uh, if there was a stair, it has been destroyed quickly. But uh, doing this, we found uh, two, two archaic tombs, uh, and uh, we were very excited because you see uh, they are perfectly sealed. Uh, there is a door. Normally, when you find a, a plundered tomb, uh, there is no more blocks in the entrance up here. It was perfect. Uh, we can uh, reconstruct a smaller tumulus on those two tombs. And, uh, uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is a, a kind of tomb which is open uh, on the top, so they had been turned up completely <laughs> but from, the, from, the, from the top. But anyway, they are rather interesting because they are uh, tombs for uh, probably for uh, a man and a woman and a couple uh, with uh, one, uh, one bench on each, uh, in each tomb. Uh, so every, nearly everything had disappeared except some uh, shirts. Uh, this is, comes not from the, <laughs> from the tomb, but those, yes. Uh, so we have a black figure, the uh, cup of the group group, uh, and uh, uh, also rather interesting uh, Bukero Bridge or Grey Bukero Reis, uh, typical of uh, the area of uh, Orvieto. And so we are in the last quarter of the 6th century before Christ. Uh, but uh, uh, we don't know if there is a relationship uh, between uh, our tomb, the Hellenistic one, and this one, probably no relation. Uh, in one of those tombs, the uh, plunderers have put all the bones they have had, uh, they were not interested in bones, and uh, uh, so we had them uh, dated, and uh, uh, it's uh, rather various, because one is archaic, three Hellenistic, one of the early empire, and uh, uh, two of uh, around 800 after Christ. And uh, after we'll see <laughs> the reason why of some well, The archaic, it's okay because uh, they come from, um, uh, from the, the archaic tomb, so it's fine. Hellenistic, it's also okay because we have this huge Hellenistic tomb. Uh, it's more complicated for the two other one, but we'll speak, uh, I'll speak about that later. Uh, so here is uh, the facade of the tomb. Uh, with, uh, I will present it with uh, three, three levels. We have a, a main level, main level rather than main terrace, uh, here. Uh, a middle terrace uh, you can reach with this stair, and an upper uh, level with another stair on the right. So uh, it's uh, 12 
meters high and 15 uh, meters uh, wide. Uh, so, uh, the, the main terrace is uh, divided in two by a huge dromos, which is uh, 15 meters long. Uh, and uh, uh, we discovered also that there was another one here, perpendicular to the, to the first one. Here you have this uh, initial view of, uh, of this level, uh, which, which is uh, rather extraordinary, is uh, uh, that uh, the two circles are, are uh, the two circles here are a base of columns, which are uh, one meter, uh, no, two meters, two meters wide, diameter, two it's two meters, uh, they were six meters high, and it's the entrance of a rather uh, uh, remarkable uh, banqueting hall with six beds that you see uh, on the along the the walls of the of the room. Uh, uh, you have so the two columns, uh, two uh, pilasters on the angles, with uh, two basements here and here, uh, for probably for uh, animals, lions, or uh, keeping the, the tomb. But unfortunately, disappeared. Uh, you see also something strange that the, uh, on the left you have a very long bed, and I'll speak about this after. So uh, some details of the, the column base, so you see the, the meter, one meter. Yeah. Uh, pieces, but unfortunately really rough and uh, difficult to say, but you, we, can, we know that uh, the whole external monument was painted, and the, the <clears throat> the beds have uh, preserved pieces of uh, the painting. Here you have a detail of uh, this pilaster with which remains of its capital on the top. Probably all that was uh, stuccoed and uh, plastered with stucco and disappeared. Uh, and uh, uh, here details uh, uh, with the beds, uh, which were made everyone with a uh, cushion, of course. When uh, they used to, when they made a banquet in this room, they used to put mattresses, cushions, and a lot of. Uh, what is extremely interesting is that uh, this was surely uh, used uh, for uh, for no banqueting for normal uh, normal <laughs> living persons, but it's divided divided in two by uh, the dromos of the tomb. Uh, so uh, when they were banqueting, they had a hole of uh, six and a half meters in the middle in the middle of the room, uh, which was certainly intentional, uh, made uh, to uh, to help uh, to communicate better the living and the and the dead. Probably they were throwing uh, wine or flowers or everything you can uh, you can imagine. Uh, so uh, the, the bed, so this uh, long bed here, I told you, uh, one uh, probably is the main, uh, the main bed of this kind of triclinium of six people. And uh, it could uh, be explained by the fact that in the uh, Hellenistic period, uh, the women in Etruria are no more uh, lying with, uh, with the male at uh, the banquet, but they are sitting uh, on the on the couch, so, so maybe we can imagine that this long uh, couch was used to have the uh, owner, the owner of the tomb, of the the, uh, the master of the dynasty, uh, and uh, women uh, seated uh, on the bed. Uh, Median terrace, it's uh, nearly completely collapsed. But uh, we have a, so we have a, a, a pilaster which is here. Probably there was another one on the other side, but it disappeared. And uh, this stair, which is very very well preserved, uh, it was completely invisible at the beginning of our uh, work. Uh, but it was closed by a wall, and indeed uh, <coughs> studying the the picture of the Royal Air Force <laughs> of the last war. Uh, we can see here, here is the, the field, here is the monument, 
And here we can see very well that there was a trench. And uh, so this part uh, of uh, the field has been fortified. Uh, probably we have uh, inside the, the wall, we have a shell of the 9th, 10th century after Christ. So here yeah, there is a kind of climb of, of little medieval uh, settlement. Uh, if we go to the top of the of the tomb, what we see, uh, which is very interesting, is that uh, there is uh, this uh, conformation with a central columen and uh, two uh, lateral uh, beams. So it means that uh, there was pediment um, in, uh, in the front of the, of the tomb. We don't have what the pediment, unfortunately, has completely completely vanished. But we have other other things, but maybe from of. Uh, more recent periods. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, 2014, we excavated the dromos. It was rather interesting because we, there is, you know, always a problem. But uh, did they uh, close the dromos after each uh, new dead in the tomb or remains? Here we have the. Um, we are nearly sure that the dromos was open and that he has uh, slowly, uh, it has been filled slowly uh, during the, the time with uh, the rain. Uh, which is so you see the situation, typical situation of a uh, tomb uh, excavated by Tombaroli with uh, one block still in uh, position and the other one uh, no more, so they enter uh, by this, uh, this hole. And uh, what is interesting is that we have uh, ancient uh, uh, nails in uh, around the door, maybe uh, to put the uh, garlands or garlands or something like that for the, the ceremonies. Uh, this is a section of uh, the bronze with uh, the hole made by the tombaroli and the various levels of. Uh, <coughs> of feeling of the dromos. That's important because it means that uh, what we find in those uh, uh, layers uh, doesn't come from the tomb and for some reason uh, put outside, but comes from uh, the top and has been, uh, so it's a material used in the banqueting uh, room. So what we find is uh, uh, Etruscan red figure uh, ceramic, just like in the tomb of in uh, in Musana, I show you, of course, not in very good <laughs> conditions, and um, traces of uh, a use of the place between the last uh, quarter of the fourth century and the second century before Christ. Uh, the inner of the tomb, uh, it's a big, big problem because uh, you've seen this facade, uh, very grand, very spectacular, and the inside is absolutely of a very, very <laughs> bad level. <laughs> uh, from uh, each, uh, each point of view, the, you see it has been carved uh, really in the pillar, the central pillar is not in the center, so uh, this is part of the bigger problem. Uh, if you see, uh, for instance, a much smaller uh, tomb, Tombale Caponia Cocchiano, the kind of reduction of uh, Grotescalina, uh, it's only five meters uh, wide, but you have, you have the same system of the dromos, which cuts a small room for banqueting, but much more. And you have uh, a true uh, room, a funeral room, uh, which is well cut. Uh, so we don't understand why this big family in, uh, in Grotescalina has not made something more regular. Uh, what we sh uh, another strange thing is that we should have uh, found those as nice uh, pictures made uh, before the departure of those sarcophagi to to Philadelphia and uh, to New York, Philadelphia and uh, Berkeley, uh, and in the tombs of the last uh, uh, last quarter of the fourth century before Christ, you. In, big Tapian family, you have to find uh, this kind of horrible but uh, typical Tarpinian uh, sarcophagus 
of the early uh, Hellenistic time. In Autumn, there was uh, one of this type, which has been plundered, so there is no more, and uh, seven others that have a plain uh, lid, which is also very strange. Um, you see the, at the beginning of the excavations, uh, the, the tomb with the sarcophagi opened by the, by the plunderers. Uh, views of the inner, also the, <clears throat> the floor is very irregular, so they had to put stones under the sarcophagi, which is not a very <laughs> nice way to add another one here. Uh, it's strange that the floor is not better uh, made. Uh, record of the tomb already, uh, the bottom here has uh, confirmed the tradition of uh, plundering of the tomb in the 70s uh, because uh, there is a date, uh, 1986, on, uh, uh, 60, 68, uh, on, the, on the bottom, so it's okay. Sometimes archaeology is of some use. <laughs> And another strange thing is that inside the tomb we find uh, only black glaze uh, ceramics, so no red figures. Normally there should be at least uh, some shells of red figures. And only uh, types that could be very well of the third century and not absolutely not of the uh, fourth century before Christ. So there is also a problem with, uh, with the material we find in the tomb. Bon, uh, other small objects, which is, in, which is interesting, is uh, those, uh, these dice and the uh, jetons, the jetons, the dice, the counters, of various materials, so, but, but all that is, uh, has been found completely uh, out of context, so I don't, uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, do very much with it. And uh, another strange thing, uh, at that time, the, in the in the Etruscan tomb, they, they write a lot. So normally, uh, sarcophagus must have the name of the dead, chiefly if it's a big family. We have one inscription, and it's complete, but it's rather disappointing because it says we lapse. So lapse is one of the most common names in uh, in Etruria, so it does not say anything. <laughs> and we is more interesting because probably it's uh, the first syllable of the name of the family. But unfortunately, there are four to six uh, Tarquinian families with begin with, beginning with we, so the Wipe, Wipina, Wipinana, or others. So uh, anyway, uh, only one inscription uh, for uh, eight sarcophagi. It's also something. So the idea is that maybe uh, this was not the true chamber of the of the tomb. Uh, we have uh, I give two examples. There are other ones. A famous one is the tomb de la Mercareccia. So you enter at this level, you arrive in this room, and you have a stair to uh, another room which is under uh, another tomb in Fondo Scatalini with the same uh, same system and. Uh, my idea at the beginning was that uh, this could be the extremity of a kind of corridor with a, with a stair uh, to this. Uh, we made a small uh, trench uh, sondage here. We've not found anything, but so we have now uh, to, to use uh, geophysical uh, methods to understand the geohazard to see if there is really a room. Uh, if there is no other room, it means that something happened and that uh, the family stopped. Uh, the, the construction of the monument that they don't they have not used it for some reason immediately and other people of the same family but later used it but in a very much uh, <coughs> a simpler way so answer maybe next month <laughs> uh, last year we, we got the second promise which was uh, for us very very exciting because uh, on this level, uh, when we begin, there was uh, one meter and a half of uh, earth, so it's, uh, it was impossible that it had been uh, excavated recently. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, this is a natural feeling of the, of the promise. 
and here you see a beautiful hall uh, which uh, goes to the to the room. Uh, we've not exactly that it's full of uh, earth. Which is interesting is that the entrance of the tomb has not the normal uh, appearance of the tomb plundered by modern tombaboli. So they leave uh, one or two blocks and enter on the, on the top. Here we have no more uh, blocks at all. Uh, and so we think, uh, for other reasons I tell you later, uh, that uh, um, the, the tomb itself has been reused as a tomb in a later, later period. Uh, bon, okay, so this is only a small piece from the second bromos, but there is nearly nothing. Uh, the typology of the, of the tomb, uh, you know those repestrian uh, rock tombs? Uh, you have the archaic, uh, it's quite different between archaic and Hellenistic uh, period, but some archaic uh, features are still uh, alive in uh, Hellenistic architecture. If you look at the tomb in Blera, you have the, the stair on the, on the right, which uh, leads to the top of the monument. So those are uh, still, this is uh, something that you can still find in uh, Hellenistic tomb uh, that, uh, just like this one. Uh, the big difference is that in an archaic tomb, uh, you enter in the tomb and you, you stay at the same level when uh, the Hellenistic one is uh, carved uh, under, well, under the ground like, uh, yeah, like you see it. So our tomb has uh, some features uh, which record uh, the Hellenistic architecture, the false uh, door, columns, uh, but it's uh, different. Uh, if we take the three, three big tombs uh, similar for the, the three only grand tombs of this level in Etruria, one is Castel d'Asso, and Castel d'Asso, uh, it's quite different. The model is the model of uh, an aristocratic house. Okay, so only a door and everything happens and the, and the, and the stairs. Uh, more complex is the Ildebranda tomb, uh, which uh, is a reproduction of a temple uh, with the Corinthian uh, columns, so a Greek temple. Uh, with an interesting uh, thing that we find the same uh, disposition of the two dromoi, one and two, yeah. uh, just as if it was uh, something uh, thought about in big families of this, uh, of this period. So one possibility is uh, uh, the main part of the family, uh, father, uh, all of that. Uh, another one uh, in Hellenistic Etruria could also be a gender uh, separation with one tomb for uh, men and another one for women. Some tombs in, uh, in Etruria have been found only with men or, or women. But as soon as we've not uh, more indications, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, but it's a big, uh, <coughs> it's a big example, uh, uh, Jumelle. The tomb uh, is the latency tomb in, uh, in Orca. This is a restitution of uh, the uh, 1923. Uh, the, the guy who made it said, uh, be careful because it's extremely preliminary. Uh, we have to check a lot of things. But as it was the only drawing of this tomb, it's still, you still find it reproduced and probably it could be uh, better than modified but the proportions are exactly the same as uh, ours and and here we have the same uh, the same problem what what is this kind of, uh, of building what 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 was the interest and family who built it uh, what what they're thinking of making this architecture which doesn't exist in uh, in italy uh, and also, maybe also, that's difficult. I show you because it, maybe you can imagine that the, the tomb in Vortescanina, when there was not the wood, was uh, evident in the, in the panorama, just like uh, this one in Barce. The tomb in Barce, well, it's not exactly the same. Uh, it's very far from Etruria. And anyway, there is a, it's very difficult to date it. Some people say 5th century or the 4th century or that. So, Let's uh, take it apart. 
uh, Etruscologists say that um, everything that uh, <coughs> comes from outside, from Greece, uh, comes first to Taranto and after in Etruria. Uh, the point is in, uh, in Taranto, or near Taranto, we have nothing that can uh, be uh, compared with uh, the two tombs of uh, Grotes Calina and uh, uh, La in, uh, in Nordia. This uh, could be some, something somewhere like, but uh, I think that there is a big uh, discussion about the validity of this reconstruction, which is maybe completely false. So <laughs> as soon as there is no more study about uh, this hypogeum, it's better to let it... Uh... Alors, uh, for the restitution, uh, uh, for the moment we have two... two but it's difficult then because, uh, because in reality it has been carved, it's a big uh, work to carve it in. And there is a lot of things that, that are not uh, easy to explain with normal uh, classical architecture. So we have those two hypotheses for the moment. So or uh, a front uh, somewhere uh, behind, or a front uh, <coughs> like uh, like this. Uh, both of them uh, meet problems, so I don't uh, begin to detail. But uh, for the moment, we are at that level, and we're working to better the restitution. Uh, so. Uh, for uh, this uh, restitution, uh, there is a strange example. So uh, it's difficult uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it has been uh, uh, published very recently. So uh, something that would be uh, more recent than our crew because it's a palace of uh, Asdrubal in, in Cartagena. Uh, Polybius says uh, Basileia, on palace, uh, uh, royal palace. Uh, which has also an intra, which would have, because also here the restitution is uh, uh, difficult, but would have an entrance of this kind with a terrace and uh, behind. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Carthage and um, and uh, and Macedonia. Now we speaking, we speak about Macedonia, uh, had uh, very near uh, links relationships. So. This could be something uh, related to, uh, just to say that this is not completely impossible. Uh, so, my favorite, <laughs> anyway, is, uh, is Virginia. Uh, it's the last, uh, last restitution of the, of the palace. And uh, uh, we obtained something which has more or less the same proportions, the same uh, relationships between the two stores. I remember that this kind of edifice with two stops doesn't exist in Italy in the fourth century before Christ. So, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to, to imagine that the address can say, ah, let's uh, do uh, something with two stores <laughs> without thinking of uh, something true. So uh, for me, it's really possible that the address can came in, uh, in Macedonia and uh, maybe as an embassy to ask um, uh, the help of the Macedonian army, uh, Philip uh, II or Alexander, uh, against the Romans, because uh, the Tarquinian people were in front of, in front of the Romans, and uh, arriving in Virginia or Pella, uh, being completely <laughs> uh, full of admiration in front of uh, this, uh, uh, the facade, as, uh, I guess it's 150 meters with a double uh, column, so something that for an Italian Something from someone from the Italian peninsula was surely really uh, amazing. So, hypothesis. Uh, so this guy, anyway, we know that this uh, the architecture of uh, Pella, of the Procura of uh, Pella de Gine has inspired uh, after a lot of uh, buildings uh, in various parts of the city. Some of them are uh, so in Macedonia uh, we have the tomb of uh, Lefkadia, which is used. Uh, uh, to restitute the facade of the palace of Pelle Vagina. And it's, um, <coughs> it's a bit, um, according to me, it's a bit, uh, it's, it's not a very good way to proceed because the tomb is a reproduction of the palace and not the opposite. And so uh, why to have uh, closed uh, windows <laughs> at the first level? I guess that in the palace those windows were open. So, so. 
the king could come and uh, appear to, in front of the, of the people. Anyway, uh, this seemed to have been his part. Perhaps uh, later, the, 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 not very much later, in the beginning of the third or end of the fourth, the gate of the Tsen era in, uh, in Tazos, and also after the Temenos, uh, the Protiron of uh, the Temenos of Athena in Pergamon, which has the same structure. So, a big uh, input coming from those palaces to architecture uh, in, uh, in classical period. Uh, and uh, indeed, if we can, if we search for uh, links between uh, Macedonia and Etruria, we can find a lot of things that have never been uh, valuated correctly. For instance, those uh, situlae that you can exchange from a tomb, Macedonian tomb to a, an Etruscan one, they are exactly the same. And Macedonia and Etruria are the two places where you find them really uh, uh, <coughs> numerous. Uh, ah, this is a, uh, it's, it's fun, I don't know, maybe it works. <laughs> uh, the Introflex Palmetta is uh, strange because it appears uh, in, uh, with the big antifixes of uh, the Parthenon, but uh, no one makes uh, this kind of uh, Palmetta after in ceramics. And that. But they are very, very used and very favorite in Macedonia in any kind of, uh, of material, bronze, ceramic, terracotta, uh, tissues, and, uh, and so on. You find those uh, uh, palmets that are also favorite in Ethiopia with this kind of, uh, of decoration. So this kind of palmet could be a kind of marker of Macedonian, Macedonian influence uh, in the Hellenistic period. Uh, funerary architecture. Uh, here we have uh, uh, three tombs, two are Etruscans, one <laughs> is Macedonian, and it's a complete exception. Uh, it's the only one in Macedonia, it's in the center, but if you find this tomb in Etruria, you have no problem, it's an Etruscan tomb. Uh, in Macedonia, it's a unique tomb, and it's of the end of the fourth century, so that gives the idea of maybe something. And here, the influence would go in the opposite direction because if you see the tomb Tolonia, it's Capulago, uh, it's a really wonderful tomb on the left. It has made, been made perfectly, and this is a poor reproduction, of course, of, <laughs> of it, but in Macedonia. Uh, the editor of this tomb says that uh, it's model uh, in Cyprus and uh, Egypt and other. So far, I've not uh, found uh, very convincing things. You have something in Cyprus, uh, in the Salamina, yeah. Uh, but uh, there are various differences, and chiefly, this tomb is uh, much later. I don't remember if the end of the third century or second century before Christ. So it could not. It, there is no, uh, no, no possible link uh, between uh, between the tomb in uh, in Macedonia and this one. Uh, so the road could be easy via Pia and after you arrive to, <coughs> to Macedonia. Uh, and uh, now we pass to the second brief part, uh, brief, very brief part of the talk. Uh -huh. uh, all around the tomb uh, from the beginning we, have lot, uh, we found a lot of uh, medieval and modern ceramics. So uh, uh, everywhere around ceramics, sorry. And there is no no place, no side, no uh, of uh, this place. Chiefly, of the, you have, we have a small place on the top, but of the uh, 16th and 17th century, we are in, in the middle of, uh, of nowhere. Uh, so uh, they came to go to the tomb. Mm. So it was a problem. We thought that there was a kind of uh, sacred uh, use of, uh, of the tomb. Um, and uh, we noticed also that uh, if you see the Tomba Latansi, the Tomba Autum, uh, Tomba Latansi is a great mound of blocks uh, collapsed. Uh, we've dug uh, one and a half meter here, and we have no block, so everything has been cleaned. So the state of destruction is the same, but uh, there was absolutely no block. So everything has been cleaned, and probably in the <coughs> 16th century. Uh, there is a modern grotto here, 
Uh, funny thing uh, is that uh, when we were digging here, there are two grottos for maybe for hermits, 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 hermits. Two gr two small grottos with a bench on each part of the tomb. And uh, when we were digging, uh, of cleaning here, uh, people were uh, here uh, heard perfectly. Uh, the other were uh, digging the, <laughs> the grotto uh, 12 meter up because there are. Uh, the rocket, but maybe there was a communication. It exists in Cappadocia, yeah, communication between uh, the room of an hermit and uh, the church. So maybe yeah, something of the kind. And this year, <laughs> for the Jubilee of Mercy, uh, we found uh, this uh, this medal, uh, a pilgrim's medal, which confirms that the place has been uh, used as a pilgrimage place. Uh, it's um, so you see uh, Porta Sancta uh, with the peacocks of uh, San Pietro with uh, <coughs> the cross and the, the Scala Sancta. Uh, and it records us uh, that uh, these uh, were near Viterbo, so Viterbo is here. So it's a very important place uh, because uh, it's uh, near the place where uh, the different. Uh, Road from Chichena to Tonica. I don't know if there is a Britannica road also. Uh, <laughs> uh, come together and you have this huge uh, crowd of people together uh, along the Via Francicena, which is only six, seven uh, kilometers far from uh, the tomb of Berlusconina. Well, if you go in internet, you can buy a similar, <laughs> similar uh, method, but We've not bought a house. Uh, and uh, one is dated uh, 17,000. Uh, the other one, uh, fourth year of the pontificate of uh, Clement uh, uh, the 10th, I guess. Uh, so uh, these kind of metals have been produced between uh, 1675 and uh, 17,000. Uh, those, uh, those are normally found in uh, tombs of pilgrims because it was very dangerous to, <laughs> to make this uh, long pilgrimage uh, with illness, uh, robbers, and uh, any kind of... Uh, so a lot of people used to die uh, and uh, probably some have been uh, buried in, uh, in Grotes Calina. And. Uh, uh, if you see uh, this uh, image of, the, of, the, of our, our medallion, uh, you see uh, the Scala Sancta with uh, Christus. Uh, here, the true Scala Sancta nowadays with uh, the image of Christus. And uh, if you look at our stars, you see on the top of it, on the last uh, level, there is something that has no uh, relationship with, uh, with the tomb of the, of the, of the stair, but which could make sense to put an image, uh, kind of table, wood, or I don't know what, with a Christus depicted. And uh, here you cannot see very well, but this part of the stair is, uh, is destroyed. And here you have small holes, two by two, uh, so it seems that they used to uh, climb it on their knees, just as uh, the, Scala, the true Scala Santa in, uh, in Rome. And this gives us a key. Why have they uh, cleaned these tombs uh, since the 16th century? Uh, it's probably because they had recognized the two main monuments of the Christian Rome, uh, the uh, Porta Santa, with this huge door uh, four meters high and uh, the Scala Santa here uh, <coughs> carved in uh, the tooth. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, which could explain uh, the, the success of this place is that uh, the family De Gentili we found in uh, archives recently that uh, the family de Gentili obtained from the Pope in the 19th century uh, the authorization to organize a fair on, uh, on their estate. This was their estate. Uh, you see Musarnak is here. We are here. 
and uh, clearly in this uh, this estate uh, the best uh, place to do this fair was along the big road which uh, went to from uh, Viterbo to Tuscania which uh, is here so this probably was the place of the fair so we can imagine that also this kind of pilgrimage in Grotescalina was favored uh, by uh, the, the presence of this fair once uh, once a year. Ah, it's finished. <laughs> <laughs>